Uh, thank you, everybody. I have to tell you, I am so in awe um, and overwhelmed by everything I heard this morning. And the talks were at such a high philosophical level, and my brain doesn't work there. I, I really struggled to keep up, and I was really thrilled with what people were saying. But knowing that my brain is on a simpler level, we're going to talk about the immaturity of the adolescent brains. <laughs> Um, oh, you know, before I go on, um, I think the PowerPoints are going to be available online for everybody, but just in case, um, my email address is my name, Jane Anderson, 1516 at Gmail. Those are numbers, 1516 at Gmail. And the reason I'm mentioning this is if you want the PowerPoint at the end, just email me and let me know, because there are going to be slides in here with references that I am not going to spend time going over, but for, if those of you are giving talks or you need references later on, um, they'll, they're on the PowerPoint and I can email it to you. Credit to a lot of people, I'm just a general pediatrician, I just do a lot of reading, and for fun, The Female Brain and the Male Brain by Luann Brizendine, who is also a professor at uh, CSF, with our great books. Uh, I am, full disclosure, <laughs> nothing um, financial, except the cost it took me to put these kids through college. Um, <laughs> four, four children and uh, five grandchildren went on the way and a foster daughter. So we had about four to five teenagers in our home um, at periods of time. I wish I knew then what I know now. <laughs> um, the objectives are, are huge, but we're gonna go through each of them fairly quickly. Um, I'm gonna try and give you an overview of adolescent brain development and how research shows how vulnerable that adolescent brain is, especially in relationship to alcohol and marijuana. Um, the criteria that are essential for medical decision making and how difficult that would be for an adolescent who has an immature brain. And then therefore, how important it is that parents are involved um, in teenagers who are contemplating abortion. And then we're going to provide you with, I hope, an alternative confidentiality conversation. So we all know adolescents is a wonderful time. I love them. Socrates said they were inclined to contradict parents and tyrannize their teachers. <laughs> Aristotle said they were fickle in their desires, heated by nature. Shakespeare actually got it the most accurate because he said, I would that there were no age between 10 and 23. For there is nothing in between but getting wenches with child, remember what those words mean, <laughs> wronging the ancient tree, stealing and fighting. And that age of 23, he got it. You know, car rental agencies won't, you know, rent to people who are less than 23, 25 years of age. So he knew, you know, back in the 1500s that these teenagers' brains actually didn't become mature until about 23, we'll say 23 to 25. Um, and just to acknowledge there's nothing new under the sun, I do international work, and you can tell the stance of those young ladies from Malawi looks just like the stance of our teenagers here. <laughs> and hopefully this, um, those of you who are pediatricians and obstetricians and other healthcare professionals, hopefully this is not your view of teenagers, that they're God's punishment for having sex. Um, I think they're delightful, and when you realize they're just recapitulating their toddlerhood as they're trying to develop their independence and learning to say no, and <laughs> all these things that are developing their own values. Values, it's sort of a fun way to look at them. So we know it's a time of rapid growth and sexual and cognitive maturation and all these changes that are going on in the adolescence. Now we know it's actually due to the changes that are happening in the brain. It just fascinates me. So um, changes taking place in the brain during adolescence are so profound they may rival early childhood as a critical period of development. So this means there are great opportunities for learning but also um, great vulnerabilities. J.G., um, many of you know that name, he was one of the first researchers who followed the brains of adolescents over time, longitudinally, with MRI scans. And he was one of the first people to say, look, these brains are not fully mature. Um, they're actually changing during puberty. And there's three ways that the brain changes. Just a quick review for those of us who are not neurologists. Um, neuronal proliferation, then myelination, and then pruning. So JG said the big surprise was when we actually started following the same child over time, there was a second wave of overproduction. So early, first sign of puberty um, tends to coordinate with the brain getting this wave of overproduction. Lots of neuronal cells are being made, they're proliferating. Gray matter can double um, in some areas in one year. 
And so with all these new nerve cells, the brain has a tremendous amount of attention. It can learn and it can um, try new tasks and, and develop all sorts of new skills. So this is a great opportunity to learn. And then that follows by myelination. And myelination, you know, is that thick, fatty um, insulation that uh, insulates the nerve cells. And it allows the nerve signal to pass down that axon much more quickly. And as it goes so quickly, that's great. It means we can do the tasks we know repetitively. I can type really quickly without looking at the keyboard. But it also means that those cells become more stiff and it's harder to learn new skills. So when I go on my medical mission trips overseas, it's really hard for me to learn how to pronounce the new language. I can't even say sheshe in Chinese, which means thank you, but it doesn't intonate right. Okay, so um, for those of you out there, <laughs> can't do it. Okay, then the final stage is pruning. And pruning is, there is now going to be competition because now there are all these cells have proliferated and they can't all survive. They're gonna compete for space, they're gonna compete for energy and for nutrition. And so the, the motto that helps us know who gets to survive is the cells that fire together, um, that wire together, fire together, and vice versa, and the use it or lose it principle. So the more you use that neuron, it's going to survive. And the cells that are not being used, they're going to die. And the cells that are dying, then are gonna prune, and be pruned and, and die away, and means that it's much more difficult for us to learn new skills as we get older. The pruning tends to happen in the brain in what we call the excitatory synapses. So the brain tends to be quieting down. During the adolescent years, the adolescent should be learning how to suppress responses. So they talk about quieting down. So what affects brain development? Well, the environment, parenting, and genetics, and we're gonna talk specifically about genetics and parenting today. So we used to debate, you know, you've heard nature, nurture, what makes us develop into who we are, and we now know that it's actually a combination of both, and we know that through epigenetics. Um, so epigenetics means that some, there are genes that will turn on the regulator proteins or turn them off, depending on what their environmental stimulation is. And once those genes are turned on or off, it's possible to pass that gene on to future generations, and they stay turned on or turn off, so <laughs> therefore our environment can now affect not just us, but future generations. And we know that about a third to a half of our 30,000 genes actually are involved in the development of our nervous system. It makes sense, it's a very intricate part of who we are. But half those genes actually do depend on the external environmental stimulation. It means that it is so crucial what are we allowing our teenage um, brains to experience. And this is just a rat experiment, but it basically just showed that if rats lived in an environment with a mother who did not nurture them and did not lick them and groom them, that their regulator proteins that told them how to respond to stress were more active and they were more reactive to stress and less likely to calm down. And that's sort of, we don't want to know that because um, we, we don't want to know that as a mother, what we did or didn't do to our kid might affect their brain development, but anyway. Hopefully my kids survived. <laughs> so um, now we know then that acquired traits can be inherited. So what we're gonna do over the next few minutes is just talk about some of the various lobes in the brain. And as I'm mentioning what's happening in those lobes, would you please be thinking, how, how does this impact me as a parent? Because I'm sure some of you out there are parenting adolescents. But also, what does it mean for me as a healthcare provider when I am taking care of adolescent patients and they are needing to make medical decisions? So the first lobe we're going to talk about is the prefrontal cortex, or the frontal lobe, and that is, as you know, the CEO of the brain. It's our strategizing center. It controls basically everything that we think of as learning and cognitive maturity. It's involved in judgment, it's strategizing, moral reasoning, planning, everything. This is all controlled by the frontal lobe. So when we think of the young child's brain, like the one, two year old, those of you who have toddlers, you know the brain is basically an imitation machine. That little toddler learns by imitating parents, brushing hair, putting on shoes, brushing our teeth, you know, that kind of thing. 
The adolescent hopefully needs to learn that you don't imitate everything that someone else is doing, and they need to learn to inhibit that imitation. So the adolescent brain should be an inhibition machine. We want to not be copying everything that somebody else is doing, not paying attention to everybody else in the room when we're supposed to be paying attention to the teacher. We want to inhibit imitation. That's what happens to the adolescent brain. So hopefully we don't want this situation. Someday, when our prefrontal cortexes are fully developed, we'll look back on this and shake our heads indeed. <laughs> so people call this process of frontal um, myelinization, they'll call it frontalization. And what this depicts is that the blue is the myelin, and you can see over time, more and more and more of the brain becomes myelinated. The top of the brain is the frontal lobe. And so by age 20, most of it is now myelinated. The next area that we want to talk about is the cerebellum. I don't know about you, but when I went to medical school, they didn't know much about the cerebellum. They thought it had something to do with muscular um, coordination, but they sort of passed over very, very quickly. And now we know that actually the cerebellum is key to navigating very difficult situations. And so the more tricky a situation is, um, the more we're gonna call on our cerebellum to navigate that situation. It helps us um, coordinate our thoughts, it helps us to problem solve, helps us to understand social cues. There is some evidence that children have Asperger's, for instance, don't have as large um, or as active a cerebellum as um, other people. So the more complicated an activity, the more we're gonna call on the cerebellum. And if the frontal lobe is mature by 20 to 25, when do you think the cerebellum's gonna be mature? Yeah, it's the last area of the brain to mature, and so it, it continues maturing in 23, 24, 25. So think about it, that young adult is still learning how to navigate situations socially and cognitively. And then there's the corpus callosum, like who in the world ever cares about the corpus callosum, I don't know, whatever it is. Um, it turns out, again, so important in how we understand, especially language, and again, not mature until early 20s. And then there's the amygdala. How many of you ever think of the amygdala? <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. It's our, it's our, <laughs> it's our fear center. I, mine's going off right now. Um, it's located in the middle of our brain, and um, it is our center for fear and emotions, um, utilized in our fight or flight reactions. Um, to no one's surprise, um, larger and has more testosterone receptors in boys. Um, why do we care about it for teenagers? This, um, you're gonna hear me say this over and over again, even in just the short time that I'm up here. The amygdala is crucial when we think about adolescents and how they make decisions. So um, teenagers, the amygdala is very, very active in teenagers, but it is not well connected to the frontal lobe. And so it's not able to process those emotions and say, why am I thinking what I'm thinking? And is that rational or is it not? So the teen, the, the, the um, amygdala is very, very active, but not connected to the frontal lobe. And so teenagers are going to misread emotions. They're going to take longer to identify their emotions, and they lack experiences to help them pick up social cues. So you know, the, the teenager comes home from school, and the teacher in class had said, oh, you know, Johnny, I'm so worried about you. You didn't turn in your homework today, and you usually do. And the teenager totally misinterprets it and comes home and says, my teacher's mad at me. You know, and so they see Mr. Robinson in computer class like that instead of the compassion that they were trying to display. So this quote, I'm gonna say it now, I'm gonna say it again when we talk about medical decision making. Adolescents start to have the computational and decision making skills of an adult if given time and access to information, but in the heat of the moment, their decision making can be overly influenced by emotions because their brains rely more on the limbic system than the more rational prefrontal cortex. I know this isn't a surprise to you. <laughs> However, it's that, it's that our science is catching up with what we all knew in common sense. Okay, risk taking. We all know teenagers take risks sort of a normal part of being a teenager. Um, emotions are heightened, you know, changes are going on in the brain, the mouse thinks he can get away with it. Um, what's happening in that pleasure reward system this, uh, that causes them to take risks? Well, a lot of it has to do with dopamine. 
um, also may be influenced by epigenetics. So there are people who tend to be more high risk takers than low risk takers. But again, this pleasure reward system called the limbic system that involves the hormone dopamine is very poorly connected to the frontal lobe. You're gonna hear that over and over again too. So they have increased activity in their limbic system, but they actually require more stimulation to actually obtain the same pleasure that we get. So there's all this activity going on, but they need heightened stimulation, hence their risk-taking um, activity. So doing you know, crazy stuff. Um, the other thing that happens with dopamine is that it does bring pleasure, and so early on, especially early on in that adolescent brain when it's just starting to mature and develop, they get that sense of dopamine, it brings pleasure, that activity is much more likely to become addicting um, because it brought pleasure. And so you'll see that if they start alcohol early, if they start marijuana early, if they start pornography early, if they start smoking early, sex early, it's more likely to become addicting. Um, and the problem um, as we get into alcohol is that alcohol actually increases the levels of dopamine and so a person who normally might be a low risk taker, like me, oh my gosh, I can't stand risk, could took me hours to get my ears pierced, you know, aww. Um, but, but if I had, had drinking, yeah, but I didn't, um, then I might become more likely to be a high risk taker and do something crazy like that. So the alcohol, I'm going to transition now into um, what alcohol and marijuana do on the adolescent brain. Um, and unfortunately, um, alcohol and marijuana both affect the adolescent brain very differently than they affect the adult brain, and it's much more detrimental to our teens. Um, alcohol specifically affects the hippocampus and how we establish new memories, which is basically learning. So what is the hippocampus? It's this tiny area in the brain um, named um, after Greek word for seahorse. Um, there it is on MRI. And this is where we learn. This is where memories come in. And um, specifically, there are some specific pyramidal cells in the hippocampus that are affected by alcohol. The earlier the teen starts drinking, the more likely that hippocampus is to be affected. Um, and the, that size of that hippocampus is affected for the rest of the teen's life. So once it's developing small, it ain't gonna grow much bigger um, during later years. Um, the other thing that happens with alcohol is it doesn't give the teens that sense of I'm sleepy, I'm, uh, I'm uncoordinated, I'm understanding that I've had enough. And so they don't get those warning signals and they're less likely to understand that they are becoming dangerously drunk. Um, it all call in the early teen also tells the teen, remember cells that, you know, fire together, wire together. So it tells the teenager, you need alcohol, you become dependent on alcohol. Um, so we don't want this. The good news is he's got a 4.0, a 3.0. Bad news is it's blood alcohol count. We don't want that. And the problem that slide showed us actually, it mentioned binge drinking on campus. And it turns out in numerous studies, it's not just alcohol intake that's bad for teenage brains and especially the hippocampus, it is binge drinking. So binge drinking actually accentuates the damage to the hippocampus. Um, and to, I know to no one's surprise here, um, marijuana um, does damage also. And I just wanted to you know, include that very briefly. Um, we know it targets the cannabinoid receptors, which are natural receptors in the brain. Um, and uh, those receptors play a great role in normal brain development. So you know it just makes sense they'd be affected by marijuana and they'd be affected adversely. And so the can cannabinoid receptors are found in these areas of the brain. And again, you've already heard me mention the amygdala, the hippocampus, the frontal lobe, the cerebellum, all those areas that are under development during adolescence are going to be adversely affected. And marijuana actually changes the way sensory information enters the hippocampus, so it's going to affect learning. Um, and it does affect uh, the prefrontal cortex and the executive functions. An article just came out last week, um, maybe you saw it, talking about new evidence that marijuana affects the prefrontal cortex and especially um, the verbal ability of that person. Um, and then maybe some of you know about this lovely longitudinal study out of New Zealand. It was a 20-year study. Um, of thousands of individuals, and those who used marijuana heavily in their teen years had a drop in IQ uh, between 13 and 38 years of age, an average of about eight points. Those who started using marijuana after 18 years, after their brains more developed, only showed minor declines in IQ, and those who did not use marijuana at all had no decrease. I fall into that category, although sometimes I wonder. <laughs> okay. Um, 
The other thing is, um, so this is actually the study I included um, that just came out last week. 3,500 patients, again, followed for over 25 years. For each of five years of marijuana use in adulthood, verbal memory decreased significantly. So that's actually showing that the uh, negative effects continued into adulthood. And then more significantly, um, those of you who are in mental health or taking care of teenagers, um, the changes that happen in the hippocampus and the brain um, are significantly the same as those that are seen in patients who have a propensity um, to schizophrenia. Uh, and the hippocampus actually does shrink over time with people who continue using marijuana. Um, all reasons for us to be advocating against the legalization of marijuana and then again, just reminding all of you that e-cigarettes is now the way that teens are take, inhaling marijuana, and that marijuana is four to three, four to thirty-fold more concentrated than um, what you or any of us might have experienced as young teenagers. And you know, not to belabor the point, but guess what? Methamphetamine does the same stuff. Okay, so if we want teens to be taking risks, I would propose to you take your kids on a medical mission trip. They can see the Maasai dancing or dance with them. That's even that'll get your dopamine going. Um, okay, um, I want this. This is a freebie. I'm throwing out mirror neurons as a freebie. It doesn't have much to do um, with uh, medical decision making, but I think it's so important as we see people on screens. Um, and using their screens. I walked into our office um, just a couple of days ago and the receptionist said to me, oh, Dr. Anderson, I'm just so distressed by what's happening. I said, what's happening? She said, well, these parents are coming in with their new babies. And she said, when, when I first started working here, the parents would be holding their babies, newborns, and looking at them and talking to them and engaging with them. And she said, now the babies are on the floor in the carrier and the parents are you know, scrolling through their cell phone. So um, just an encouragement, it's not just our young people that have problems with um, cell phones, it's the adults. Um, and what are mirror neurons? Who here, I'm just curious, who here has heard of mirror neurons? Oh, quite a few of you, okay, good. You were, you were, you were last year's talk that I gave. <laughs> um, so um, first found in uh, labs in Italy, um, neurologists was studying um, monkeys and um, had them all hooked up with EEGs and noticed that the monkey's um, EEG was going off for hand-to-mouth behavior, either when the monkey did hand-to-mouth behavior or the monkey was watching the researcher do hand-to-mouth behavior. And so these are called mirror neurons. They are involved when either an individual acts or experiences an emotion, or they see another person act or experience an emotion. So right now my eyes are trying to pick up like from your eyes, like are you interested or not? And I'm picking up your emotions. And so that is the development of mirror neurons. And people told me when I was interested in adolescent brain development just a few years ago, they said, oh, don't worry about mirror neurons. They're all formed by the time kids are four or five. Guess what? They're not. And so um, you can read um, cognitive empathy, the mental ability to take another's perspective is undergoing dramatic changes during adolescence. And UCLA came out with a great study last year. Um, the Poly Institute is a nature institute down in our nature camp down in San Diego. And they took two groups of kids. One of the classes went to the camp, one of the classes was the control group and stayed home. And all they did was have these teenagers for five days, that's it, five days, they were allowed no screen time. And then they measured their ability to understand somebody else's emotions and their compassions before they went to camp and at the end of camp, five days without screen time. And guess what? In five days without screen time, they improved in their ability to interpret another person's emotions. And so we wonder why our teenagers are willing to do nasty things to other people is because they've been doing this on their phones and not seeing another's emotions and learning. So we really don't want experiences like going to Grand Canyon and seeing it like that. Okay, so hope I've convinced you very quickly. Brain is reconfigured during adolescence. <laughs> Get me all confused. <laughs> It's more easily damaged and more susceptible to environmental factors. And it's the wrong time to be experiencing drugs and alcohol and smoking and all those other negative influences. So um, we don't, we don't, I don't agree with this. Stop making such a big deal. Um, we are going to make a big deal because going astray is not something we want them to do. And we want them to know that parents do matter. And scientific research provides evidence that effective parenting can prevent exposure to these damaging experiences or minimize their impact on the brain. So parents are needed. And even the AP and NIH agree parents are needed because adolescence does rival the terrible twos. 
Um, so Dr. Sarah Johnson from uh, Johns Hopkins says, continue to parent your child. Teens have specific developmental vulnerabilities. They need parents to limit their behaviors, duh. And more, more quotes that just say, teens need parents. Just because you graduate from high school next year doesn't make us lame duck parents. And so basically we're telling parents, be your teen's brain, they need you to be their frontal lobe, their amygdala, all those different things. They have to help them problem solve. One of the best studies that looked at that was a national longitudinal study on adolescent health following over 12,000 teenagers longitudinally. Teens who felt highly connected to their parents were far less likely to participate in any high-risk behavior, including sexual activity, and yet what do we do when teens First thing we do when teens come into the office, medical students, separate them from their parents. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Keep them connected. So the other thing parents need to do is convey values. And just um, of several studies, but one that showed if a parent one time said, I don't want you smoking marijuana, the teen was three times less likely to use marijuana. So we need parents to be conveying values. Um, I'm going to skip that. Hands-on parenting is another thing that people have looked at. It's called monitoring. Um, basically saying, teenagers, um, do your parents know where you are, what you're doing, who you're talking to, who you're sexting, who you're texting, all that. Um, and if they, those teens whose parents sort of knew everything and also ate dinner with the teens and assigned them chores and conveyed them values, those teens were markedly, markedly less likely to participate in any high-risk behavior. So a meta-analysis that just came out um, December of 2015 showed that higher overall parental monitoring, monitoring knowledge, rule enforcement were associated with delayed sexual intercourse. We should be promoting parental guidance is recommended for everything. So what does this mean for medical decision making? I mean, we always knew teenagers lacked life experiences and knowledge and they're risk takers and all that. But now we know that adolescents have this immature prefrontal cortex that makes it harder for them to plan, strategize, evaluate. And they're much more likely to base their decisions on emotions and peer influences. Duh, I know this is all not new to you. So I'm gonna just go over some of these criteria. I'm gonna go through them quickly. Please don't be frustrated. They're gonna be on the PowerPoint if you need it later. Um, what are the legal requirements for medical decision making? They're quite complicated actually. For informed consent, the decision must be informed, voluntary, and the individual must be competent. What does it mean to be competent? It means there's evidence of a choice, a reasonable decision, and that they have good cognition. Oh, what's cognition? Well, they have to be able to do abstract reasoning and understand illness and treatment concepts, blah, blah. And what does abstract reasoning mean? Well, it has to include also the ability to weigh more than one factor. And prioritize abstract variables and take a future time perspective. And oh my goodness, they're supposed to incorporate their religion and cultural values and understand their own emotional well-being and how that's impacting their decision making. Yeah, really? <laughs> and if you're gonna say what's informed decision or informed consent for an abortion, it has all these things. Understanding the nature and probable consequence of one situation, understanding alternatives. You get the picture, it's very, very complicated. And adolescents, in addition, don't have a great fund of knowledge and they're affected by their emotions. And so e even Finer, who was looking and trying to say, is it those bad, nasty, pro-life people who are delaying adolescents getting abortions? He found that adolescents' abortions were delayed. Why? Because it took some of them longer to figure out they were pregnant. Um, and now we're back to adolescents and emotions and how that impacts their decision making. So these are quotes from a Journal of Healthcare Law and Policy. This is you know, not a, a pro-life organization by any means. Executive function, that's your prefrontal cortex, and emotional responses are not just less developed or different in teens, the two capacities are less closely linked than in the typical adult brain. As a result, a teen may intellectually understand an issue and emotionally have a response to that issue, but the two processes occur in parallel instead of in dialogue with each other. So emotional executive functions must work together to bring about almost any kind of decision. And I was fortunate enough, um, Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felsher um, is a colleague of mine at UC San Francisco, and she testifies all over on the ability of adolescents to make excellent decisions. 
And she, I went to a conference and she argued that there's no need for parental involvement because guess what, adolescents are making decisions, they're making decisions every day. And you and I know that as adolescents we make decisions, but she did acknowledge in her talk I heard her and I wrote it down very quickly, that their amygdala is poorly connected to their frontal lobe and they place greater emphasis on their friends' reactions. So she said they might decide that taking a risk is worth it if it maintains their social status. So we're back to this thing that in the heat of the moment, adolescents are more impacted by their emotions. I would question with all this if any of us as adults could give informed consent. <laughs> Certainly not adolescents. And even the American um, Psychological Association acknowledges that they have argued before the Supreme Court two contradictory um, philosophies. They have argued that adolescents are developmentally immature when arguing that they should not suffer the death penalty. But they've argued that they're cognitively mature when they argue against criminal involvement laws. And there is actually in the American Psychologist, this thing, this title says, are adolescents less mature than adults, minors access to abortion, the juvenile death penalty, and the alleged APA flip-flop. So they've been accused of flip-flopping, and they get out of it by saying, well, you know, in some circumstances, this part of the brain is more mature than that part of the brain, and they just waffle. Okay, it's ridiculous. Um, so the other thing you should know about adolescent decision-making, because um, you're, you'll, you'll hear it. Adolescents, this article comes out and says, adolescents make great decisions and equal to adults. Well, they do that in controlled settings, in a lab, in a hypothetical decision-making situation, um, with everything hypothetical going on. And guess what the definition of an adult is? I shouldn't have put this slide up there so you can see the answer. The definition of an adult in those studies is somebody who's over 18, but we're saying their brains aren't even mature until 23 or 25. So if I compare a 17-year-old's brain to an 18 or 19-year-old's brain and I say the teenager is equal to the adult, that is not what we're talking about when we're talking about parental involvement laws in a parent who is now, you know, hopefully 40 years old or so. But those are the studies that are used to promote confidentiality. And no, we don't think the teens know everything. And so the AP says the minor is capable of providing informed consent if they're sufficiently mature and possess the intelligence. Yeah, really. But they'll also say that adults can provide external structures and executive functioning to children. And that adolescents who are willing to involve their parents will do better. Um, so confidentiality, this concept of adolescent confidentiality disregards every bit of information I've just told you on the adolescent brain and its immaturity, and there's much more that we could have said. It also disregards the National Longitudinal Study on Adolescent Health that says teenagers do better when they're connected to their family. <coughs> so instead of encouraging this connectedness, it actually undermines the relationship. And it places physicians, you've all been in that situation, in total conflict with the parents, and I think what's worse is confidentiality basically says to the teenager, I will collude with you to deceive your parents. It's horrible. And Lainey Ross um, testified in Congress, what are we teaching our adolescents when they find persons in authority willing to help them deceive their parents? What does it teach these adolescents with regard to respect owed to any adult, least of all a deceitful doctor or duped parent? So I would advocate AP needs to review and revise their criminal notification for abortion involvement laws. Um, the um, confidential um, conversation that I would have, suggest that you have with families, um, and um, I'm gonna take a, one minute to plug the American College of Pediatricians here. We have on our website for members only, and so all of you can get a free year's membership um, and the trainees, as long as you're in training, please sign our, up on our form because in there is a, what we call our conversations project and this confidentiality conversation is part of what's in there. So I talk with teens and their parent, early teen or whatever, with their parent or guardian or grandparent, and I do the confidentiality spiel, you know, I have to keep things confidential, whatever your state law is, um, and then um, what I can't keep confidential, if you're gonna hurt yourself or someone else or, or you're, um, someone's hurting you, then I go further and I say, but I'm not there for you 24 seven. The person who loves you the most, hopefully you know them, is sitting right here. And so if you tell me to keep something confidential, oh, I will and I must, I don't want you suing me, but I'm gonna be encouraging you to talk to your parent. And if you need help, if you're too scared, we'll do it together. And I've done that together with teenagers and their parents. And you know, sometimes it's not, it doesn't turn out the way I want. 
um, the parent forces the teen to have an abortion or whatever, but you know, I'm gonna make sure they're talking together. And, um, and so that conveys to the parent and the teenager that I want this, not that. Okay, very quickly to end, I want you to know a little about, a bit about parental involvement laws. Um, I testified in Alaska in support of their parental involvement law um, when it was challenged by Planned Parenthood. I'm gonna be doing the same in Montana. So we need to have good evidence that documents the benefits of parental involvement, and we have it. So there is no credible research that I could find, and I just reviewed it last week, um, that documents any increase in illegal or unsafe abortions, no increase in second trimester abortions, no significant delays in obtaining an abortion, no um, evidence that ev adolescents travel out of state to obtain that abortion, no increase in violence against pregnant adolescents by parents, and no increase in depression or suicide. And the research does show benefits. There's a decrease in abortion rates without an increase in birth rates. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna give you a schizophrenic message. I'm saying adolescents need parental help, but I'm also gonna tell you, yes, they can make decisions. And guess what? They make decisions based on what the laws are in their state. And they will change their behavior based on parental information and notification laws. Um, there is possibly a decrease in sexually transmitted infections and possibly a decrease in suicide and depressions. Again, the next slides I'm gonna go through very quickly. They're just up there for you to know that I'm using evidence-based medicine and that their references are there if you want them. The AAP consistently misquotes the Henshaw Post article to say 30% of minors had experienced family violence and fear it would recur if the parent were informed of the pregnancy. That is a lie, damn lie, damn, damn lie. It is a horrible lie, and in that article, 1% at the most 2% of teens experience violence. Not that we want any of them to, but it's a much lower number. When Arkansas shifted from parental notification to parental consent, they found no detrimental effects, and with judicial bypass, the minors who used the judicial bypass were actually less likely to have a second trimester abortion than those who had parental consent. This is a more recent article just last year in Obstetrics and Gynecology. They looked at New Hampshire who implemented a parental notification law, and then they looked at neighboring Vermont and Maine and showed that there was no increase in Vermont and Maine's abortion, so kids were not traveling, and abortions among minors in New Hampshire's decreased. Um, and that PI laws can change adolescent behavior. I'm gonna skip through this so we go through very quickly. Um, and just because it, we're here in Texas, um, it was, there was a great article that came out um, looking at Texas's um, parental involvement laws and um, abortion rates decreased after parental notification law. Teens did not travel, it's a huge state. There was no change in birth rates and the only negative effect was that abortions happening after 12 weeks did increase slightly and those teens who got pregnant when they were like 17 and a half, they waited until they were um, 18 to get their abortion. And so there are definitely beneficial effects. The teen um, uh, abortion rates fall, birth rates fall, um, and that there's more and more. So overall, um, parental involvement laws incorporate our current research on adolescent brain development and the immature decision making that they have. There's little evidence of societal or individual harm with implementation of parental involvement laws, and there is evidence of benefit with decreased adolescent risky behavior and lower abortion rates. Um, adolescent brains immature and really susceptible to all these nasty toxins, and so they navigate their teen years best when they've got their parents. Thank you.